The Bible, the Bible is truly an amazing, a magnificent book. It is one of exceptional popularity as well. Even though it was completed almost 2,000 years ago, it is still the world's most popular book as far as sales goes because each year it leads the list of bestsellers. While my figures might be a few years old, there wouldn't be that much difference in them as to what then and now. But there are about 25 million Bibles, New Testaments or portions of the Bible that are produced each year. 25 million. Now, if you're like me, that number kind of just uh, is incomprehensible. I don't know what 25 million would be. So if we break it down, though, we might get a little bit better figure of that because that works out to about 67,680 every day. Now, that's still a whole lot. Uh, I'd hate to count that many. So if we break it down to every hour of every day, you would have 2,870 being produced every hour, every day. Now one that uh, really gets more in my line of numbers would be that every minute of every day, 47 Bibles, New Testaments, or portions of the Bible are produced. 47 every minute. That shows the popularity of the Bible. Yet, as popular as the Bible is, is how many numbers of Bibles that are sold, it is literally amazing how little we know about this book, which is the greatest of all books, the Bible. When you look at the word Bible, it says Holy Bible across the front. <laughs> Bible. The term Bible itself, the scriptures never refer to themselves as Bible. The Greek word, it is from a Greek word, Biblia in actuality. It is a plural form of the Greek word biblos, which means literally books. Biblia, the plural form, books. Over the years, as we looked at these books, 66 of them in all, when we put them together, we recognize that they make up one book. And though even though it is a plural form, we recognize the singular nature of it because it is a unified whole when you put those 66 books together. This Bible is divided into two main divisions. There is the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Old Testament consists of 39 books and 929 chapters in our present day Old Testament. Now I say that because uh, if you want to do some research, uh, the Jewish Bible held, depending on the count, not the content, but the count of the books, either 22 books or 24 books. Uh, while we have 39 books. Uh, it is not a matter of content. It was a matter of arrangement. For example, just to give one of the several that accounts for the majority of them, we have 12 books of minor prophets. They combine those 12 books into one book. 
And so they had one, we have 12. That accounts for quite a bit of the difference right by itself. But it's the same content even though dividing it up is a little bit different. I can remember when I was a very small boy, I went to a congregation and I grabbed one of their Bibles in the back of the pew and Genesis only had 48 chapters. And I said, where's the other two? <laughs> they forgot a couple of chapters. And I was quickly instructed, it's a matter of arrangement, not content. I still haven't found another one like that, but... Uh, <clears throat> But in our, thus our present day Old Testament, there are 39 books and 929 chapters. The New Testament, on the other hand, it consists of 27 books. And there are 260 chapters in the New Testament. If you're doing a little bit of math, that makes the Old Testament about three and a half times larger than the New Testament. And that three and a half, thus, is an interesting number because if you read three and a half chapters a day in the Bible, you can read the entire Bible in one year's time. Now, that doesn't take all that much time. At an average 8th grade reading level, that's 250 words per minute. It would take less than 8 minutes a day to read the Bible through an entire year. The average American used to watch television about 5 hours a day that number has come down recently to under four hours a day. The average American used to read the newspaper an hour a day. That number has been reduced a great deal because now instead of getting a newspaper, we get our smartphones or we get on our computer and we read the news there. I don't know how many uh, hours a day the average American spends on Facebook or other social media, but it would, I would say, take up more than that slack of those reductions in both television and reading the newspaper playing on the computer, playing games on the smartphones. We see it all the time. People can't even walk down the street without texting or without being on Facebook or without playing a game. And yes, there's those funny videos of people who are doing so and they fall into water fountain things running into people. Why? Because their head is buried in that. The point is, we spend a great deal of time in things like into that. While it would take less than eight minutes a day at an average eighth grade reading level, 250 words a minute, to read the Bible through in one year's time. Yet how many have done that? <clears throat> I dare say that of those millions and millions of Bibles that are produced every year and sold, because they're not going to produce them unless they sell them. There's a correlation there, of course. But I wonder how many people who buy them actually read them. If they've gone and started at the book of Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1 and read it all the way through to the end of Revelation. 
or if they use it more as an ornament on a coffee table or some other place that just sits there and gathers dust. We basically do in the United States what we want to do. If we want to read the Bible through and if we want to study the Bible and learn the Bible, we can do it. I mean, it's not a matter of our inability. It's a matter of our desire. We simply don't want to do these things. We are so infatuated with the technology of today, with the current events of today, with this and with that, that we don't spend the time with God's Word. But as I mentioned, this is a testament. We talk about the Old Testament and the New Testament. A testament is very simply a will. It's what the word means. It comes from the Greek word diothike. Corresponds to the Hebrew word berith. The Hebrew word berith is more technically a covenant, though. We'll get to this in just a second, but it is a will. The last will and testament of Jesus of Nazareth is what the New Testament is dealing with. And by the way, just as if you have written a will in the past, a testament, and then you write a new one, guess what happens to the old one? It's no longer in effect, it's no longer effective. You don't go by it. And if you die and you say in that old one that your goods are left to so-and-so, but in the new one you said, my goods are left to this person over here instead, guess how much old so-and-so over there is going to get? Nothing, because that will has been done away with. It has been rescinded in that way. We are not subject to that Old Testament. We are subject to that New Testament. But the word Old Testament itself is somewhat of a misnomer. The Old Testament never refers to itself as a testament. It is always referred to as a covenant, an agreement a contract, a pact between what we'll see is God and Israel primarily. That's the Old Testament. It's a covenant. That's what they recognized it as. When you get into covenants, though, there are two different types of covenants. There is a covenant between equals. In that situation, you have two parties that are making an agreement with each other. But because both of them are equal with each other, one cannot dictate the rules to someone else, to the other party. The other party has the right to make their own agreements and their own statements, and you can dicker back and forth until you come away with a contract that states, here's what's going to be done. And then both parties are subject to that contract. Or you can walk away from it and not agree to it. That's a covenant between equals, though, Each party has their own bargaining rights because one's not superior to the other. We make those kind of agreements all the time within our life as we live our life. An agreement with someone else might not be a... We might not write it out in a contract form. We might not go to a lawyer to have a contract written up, but we have a contract, an agreement between two parties. And some can say, one party can say, I want this, and the other party says, I want this. And they go back and forth until they reach an agreement. 
but that's bargaining rights because we're equals. There is a different type of covenant, though, and that is a covenant between unequals. In a covenant between unequals, you have one individual who is superior to the other individual, who is inferior one. In relationship to the Old Covenant, that Old Testament, you have a covenant between unequals because you have God who is superior and man who is inferior. In a covenant between unequals, the superior one says, here's what I want. The inferior one doesn't have the right to bargain or to change or to alter that which the superior one says. God is the superior one. God has said, here's my will, here's my desire. Man, being the inferior one, can say, no, I'm not going to do that. Because God has made us as a free moral agent where we have the ability to choose. Even as Joshua called upon the, the children of Israel in Joshua 24 and 15, to choose you this day whom you will serve. They had the right to choose because they were free moral agents. But they did not have the right to say, well, God, I don't like this part here, and let's take it out, and let's substitute this for this part of it, because that's really not what I want, and, and argue back and forth and bargain back and forth. Man didn't have that right. God has the right, being the superior one, to say, here it is. Now, if you live faithful to it, you'll be blessed. If you don't live faithful to it, you'll be punished. Man has the right then to live according to it and be blessed, or he has the right to reject it and be condemned. But he does not have the right to bargain or to change those things. In the 50th Psalm, though, the people of that day tried to basically bargain with God. And their thinking was, well, we'll do these things and God won't do anything about it. And in verse 21 of, in Psalm 50, he, <coughs> he says, These things thou hast done, and I kept silence. Thou thoughtest that I was altogether such a one as thyself. But I will reprove thee, I will set them in order before thine eyes. You thought I was like you. You thought I was man, just like you are. And you treated me as such, and thus you did not do what I said. And he says, I'm going to reprove you. You're going to set it in order before your eyes. God was going to condemn those individuals because they thought that they could do what they wanted to and God would be pleased with it. I make an application to what we see today in the religious world. Man comes along or hears God and he says, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, that we must preach repentance and remission of sins among his or in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And thus, in looking at those passages, we must teach belief, that's faith in God, faith in Jesus Christ as the Son of God, and that he died for our sins, repentance on our part, that is, recognizing our sin, turning away from that sin, and turning to God, and we must then be baptized in water for, in order to have the forgiveness of our sins. Man comes along and says, well, I think it's, we're going to be saved by grace only. Or I think we'll be saved by faith only. Or all you have to do is put your hand on, on your heart or on some object and say, Lord, I accept you into my heart. And have this sinner's prayer that you can never find within the Bible because it's not there. 
and they think that God will accept such. Why? Because they have made themselves equal with God. They brought God down to their plane and said, God, you have to accept this salvation that we have set forth, that we have determined to be right, instead of our submitting to His will. We see it in, the, in worship, in mechanical instruments and music. The majority of people, who, if you ask them, why do you use mechanical instruments and music in worship? Well, we like it. It's enjoyable. And didn't David do it? It's because it's what they desire. And they are saying to God, God, you are equal with us. And even though you said sing, we can add this because we like it. We've got brought God down to man's level and said, I have the right to bargain with you and you have to accept what I have determined that I like. Now we try to make this a covenant between equals instead of what it is, a covenant between unequals where God is superior and man is inferior. Now, I said the Old Testament was somewhat of a mis misnomer. The New Testament declares that the Old is a testament as well as the New. A testament embraces everything that the word covenant embraces. It is, a testament is a covenant. It is a pact or an agreement. But it goes beyond that in that a testament, unlike a covenant, a testament is based upon the death of the testator. The Old Testament writers did not understand everything about the New Testament. Uh, that's why it, the New Testament refers to it as a mystery. Notice in Ephesians 3 and verse 5, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. It was not known to them of the Old Testament times, but now then it has been revealed to the apostles and prophets during this New Testament period of time. And thus we can understand and we have an understanding that those great individuals during the Old Testament times did not have an understanding of. Even though they wrote about it, they didn't understand it. And I think... Uh, Isaiah 53 would be the greatest example of that that we can see. Here's the Ethiopian in Acts the 8th chapter reading Isaiah 53. Do you understand it? No, how can I except some man show me? Was he talking about himself or someone else? Don't understand it. Why? Because you didn't have an understanding of Christ. It was written by Isaiah, yes, but they didn't understand it. And so, Philip, who had an understanding of this New Testament time, joined himself and preached unto him Jesus. Why? Because that's who Isaiah had been speaking of. But they didn't know it until the time of Jesus. So the New Testament will reveal things about the Old Testament that really they did not understand. They did not understand that that covenant that they were under and that they were dealing with was in reality a testament. Again, a testament embraces everything that a covenant is, but is also based upon the death of the testator. Notice in Hebrews, the ninth chapter, and verse 15, where he says, For this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Here's the New Testament he talks about, but by means of death. 
that's the death of Jesus Christ, those under the First Testament. He now reveals that that old covenant, which they understood it as, it was also based upon the death of Jesus Christ, even as the New Testament is based upon the death of Jesus Christ. Both of them are based upon the death of Jesus Christ, and thus you have an Old Testament and a New Testament, not just an Old Covenant as they understood it during their time. Go back a few chapters in Hebrews to Hebrews, the second chapter in verse 9, where he says, But we see Jesus, who is made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. Oftentimes when I think members of the church read that, <clears throat> that he should taste death for every man, in their minds... <clears throat> they read it as that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man since Jesus died. That's the way in which we oftentimes apply it. But it's talking about every man from Adam to the man who, the last man that's alive here upon this earth when Christ comes again. Every man not just those under the New Testament period, but also under the Old Testament period. That he died for them even as he did for us. Now why? Because under that old covenant that God had made with them, they would offer sacrifices for their sins. But those sacrifices could not take away the sins. Hebrews 10 and verse 4, it says, For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sin. It wasn't possible for those animals to take away sin, but they were looking forward to the coming of Christ and His death upon the cross, which was able to take away our sins, which was able and is able to redeem us, to cleanse us from all iniquity. And so while they could not have the true forgiveness under the old covenant because all they had was the blood of bulls and goats. Yet it looked forward to that coming time in which Christ would take their sins away. Thus, that old covenant in their understanding was based upon the death of Jesus Christ. Even as that new covenant that we are under is based upon the death of Jesus Christ. And the blood of Jesus Christ goes back to cover those individuals under the Old Testament who were faithful to that testament, that covenant. Even as it goes forward to our time to cleanse us from our sins when we are obedient to that which God has set forth. Now, to, to have those forgiveness of our sins, it's going to be done by the blood of Jesus Christ, 1 John 1 and verse 7. But it is that blood of Jesus Christ is applied to those sins by the purifying of our souls and obeying the truth through the Spirit into an unfeigned love of the brethren. It says, see that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. Being born again, we sang the song about the new birth this morning. Being born again, how is that birth? It is a birth of water and the Spirit. It is a birth that involves the Spirit's revelation of God's will to us so that we will know what to do to be saved. It involves water. And that's the aspect of baptism in water so that we can, in that water grave of baptism, contact the blood of Jesus Christ and have our sins washed away and thus be pure and clean and whole and fit for heaven. But it doesn't stop there. That's the beginning point of Christianity and we then live that type of life that God has set forth. We live according to the precepts that are found within that New Testament. And if we don't, then we lose that inheritance. But we can come back unto Him and repent 
And that's 1 John 1 and verse 9. That if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Thus, if your need this morning is to obey that gospel of Jesus Christ and being baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, or you need to repent and respond to that gospel and coming back to Jesus Christ, letting us pray with you for the forgiveness of your sins, we would encourage you to come as 